So over to you, Sandy. Thank you for your time today. Much appreciated. Okay, now I'm going to do this with the, the screen up just so that I can see you guys and see what you're saying and things. Um, I'm going to ask those of you that have a Gmail account and have a phone handy to just have a little play. And we're not going to dwell on this and if you can't do it like because you don't have a Gmail account or whatever, um, don't stress. This is just an activity that we're going to have a look at at the end. And what I would need you to do is... Have a look at the QR code that is in here and I'll introduce this again later. But if you've got your phone, take a photo of the QR code and what it's going to do is it's going to um, show you how to download the Flipgrid app and it's just going to allow you with, with probably minutes, with less than minutes, it's going to allow you to create an on-the-fly video. And the request, if you are going to play, and I made some of these guys do it before we started, was to just say hi to everyone, introduce yourself, and just share one positive thing that you have achieved this week. And with you guys teaching online, um, with kids at home and at school and your own kids, um, I, I know there have been bunches of flowers sent, and if I could, I would send you all bunches of flowers. So it's a case of just tell us one of your things that you have achieved this week. No stress, okay? So if you get a chance to do it, do it. The other thing that I've done is I have made this presentation available on the bit.ly bit link that is there. And in fact, I think I can quickly just shove that into the chat. And so anybody who wants to follow along with this presentation, you can certainly do that and pull the links out of it and things like that. I just, um, I put some stuff up about myself simply because um, I just sort of thought you're probably going, oh God, some Sheila from New South Wales, what on earth are they doing? But I, I did not make my 35 year working in the department. I missed out by about a month and I'm not bitter and twisted at all that I didn't get that certificate, but I did not get that certificate. So I'll just have to learn to deal with it really. So long time in the department. And one of the highlights for me as a teacher was, in fact, literally unboxing the internet at Altona Green Primary School and trying to work out what the internet was. Um, it was. It came in a box. If you can ask the old people at your school how that all worked, because we just plodded along and did the best we could. And that's sort of what I'm going to talk about, sort of where we've come from, what the department and all education departments' responses have been, what parents' responses have been right from the back. Okay, the QR code, I will very, very, very quickly, if you could just jump in there, might even transfer it with me when I'm doing the presentation. So let's have a look at what we have, what we're going to have a look at today. We're going to have a look at where we are in terms of along the grid of sort of, I suppose, disruption and disruptive technologies and things, where we've gotten to. Um, I want to really make some points about some of the issues that I, I'm assuming you guys are facing, but also um, just a message that I'm hoping that you'll be able to give to parents that if you do encounter any issues, that if they're cyber issues or behavioural issues around technology is to take the technology out of everything and just look at what the behaviours are. The technologies can make things worse. They can be deliberately made worse because of kids' knowledge around technology. But generally, it's always about behaviour. So it's much easier to talk about and address the behaviours. So that, that will be my banging on point that you will hear. Um, we're going to have a look at some of the legals and policies and Deb Hicks, thank you so much. Um, Deb pointed me into a couple of the changes and developments that have occurred. I was in the department, I think, two years ago. So two years wouldn't seem such a long time, but you think of all of the, the change that we've had. So some of those things have changed and I'm going to highlight those. Um, the other thing is we're going to have a look at some resources and then I'm just going to present some homeschool projects that I think you could talk about with your kids and their families. Now, the reason I've made this presentation available to you guys is I am, I am absolutely happy for you to take any bits of it and share it and present it. And if you want to present it to parents, if you want to talk to students about it, 
um, because one of the last activities that I have is about your students creating a parent information night and that can be done online or that can be done face to face. So we'll unpack that as we go along. I probably should have put this slide first, but what I would like to do is acknowledge the traditional custodians and the land on which we meet. And the great irony of that is that we are covering such a broad group of um, Aboriginal elders, past and present, that we're referring to. Um, the different community, communities, the Wurundjeri people is um, where you guys, some of you are at, Gadigal is where um, I am at at the moment. But I suppose one of the things that we would really like to do is um, respect and um, observe the, the importance of the cultures and customs and tradition of Aboriginal Australia, but also just recognise that when Aboriginal people met, a lot of it was around educating and communicating and building knowledge, and hopefully we'll do the right thing by that as we progress through this session. Just having a look. This is probably where the presentation, I suppose, um, unpacks itself. And I found this picture when I was sort of pulling this together. And it's a Kodak moment. And for those of you that are old enough to remember, a Kodak moment was something that you remembered and you treasured forever. Now, whilst this is not a picturesque time and it's not a great celebratory time, it is certainly a time that people are going to remember. They're going, you'll remember it for your lives and your kids will as well. The time when there was lockdown and um, that you didn't go to school and all sorts of things. And in a way, what it's going to do is it's going to give us um, some cause to stop and think, but it's also going to give us an opportunity to have a look at what did we do? And when you think about the way that people just got on with it, it's phenomenal. Um, what did we do? What do we learn? What's worth keeping? And how do we keep going with what we're doing? Now, I, the grey bit in this slide is in fact just a, um, a quote that I took off a Victorian school website that I, I knew was, was a terrific school, so I knew they'd have great stuff on their website. I am going to read it. I hate reading off slides, but I am going to read this because it says, this is what the school's declaring to their parents. We value international mindedness and prepare our students to be global citizens with a passion for the world at large. We want them to explore it, engage with it and succeed in it. And what we are finding at this particular time is that the capacity to use digital technologies, the internet, different apps, different bits and pieces, safely, responsibly, respectfully is really key to that. And so when we stop and have a look at our Kodak moment, it's thinking to ourselves, what is it we want to keep? What are the messages that we want to preserve and how do we go forward? What it does is it's redefines supervision. And I have no doubt there would be schools that are struggling with that and other places that have done it incredibly well. We are now presented with a whole option of no filters, no filters in schools when kids are working at home. Um, there's also different pieces of advice. Interestingly enough, the main um, big production or the big push here in New South Wales Department is about using Zoom and Zoom is now integrated through the department systems and all sorts of things. But they did a whole lot of work to it to make it that way. But three days ago, I think it was, the eSafety Commissioner pu published a blog post about how how terrible Zoom was and how all sorts of things. So if I was a parent in New South Wales, I'd be going, hold on, what's going on here? The eSafety Commission is telling me this, the department's Zooming my kids and all sorts of things. So where, where do we put our faith? And that's one of the things that um, parents would be struggling with at the moment. Um, this totally relies on parent-teacher communication and um, that can be that can also include students of course but what this the success of all of this truly relies on is smart nice kids who do the right thing when no one's watching and this is going to either celebrate or expose 
lots of those things, whether or not they're, they're positives or they're not so positives. And as um, Daryl was saying, we are seeing an instance where there is a whole lot of stuff happening that's not so positive. But let's flip to the positives because I'm a bit of a um, glass half full girl. Um, I'm going to give you a quick history about how we got and why the department responds in the way that it does. And, and it's been a long journey since we started. And I'm not going to bang on too long, but I think it's important to understand that it's always reactive. And it's always reactive because you never know what they're going to cook up on the internet. Web 1, for those of you who were around long enough, basically it was like books online. You had to be an important person, write software, you could create content, but the only people who could see it, all they really got was text and images. Websites were designed like books with, you know, sort of, um, you could go through, if you look at web design and you look at the structure of a web, it does look like a book and it's chapters and all sorts of things. That's what it was. And in those days, the only thing that really truly was of risk to kids was either the, the whole notion of predators or it was that kids would see inappropriate content. So the department, parents, all advice was built around filtering. Everything was about trying to block the bad stuff out. And that still hangs over. And as I was saying before we started, New South Wales actually has a centralised system whereby um, teachers have to ask the department to open a website. So you can't do it at your school like you can at Victoria. So no YouTube for any primary kids or secondary kids up till year 11. So they're very um, strict and regulated around what they do. So that choice is not there. This week is the first time they have opened um, YouTube for kids. So we'll see what happens when kids go back to school. Web 2 came and that was just exciting and brilliant and wonderful and we use lots of it in our classrooms now. The challenge was that it's now two-way. Kids could now produce stuff, teachers could produce stuff and that was really empowering. So anyone had the capacity cr to create and publish. It was multimedia rich. You could use you could use your phone, you could make a video, you could do all sorts of things. Everyone had a voice. You could carry it anywhere and you could take it anywhere. And the challenge around that wasn't so much about what kids would see, it's about what kids would do. What would they do with the content that they'd created? Where would they put it? Um, so all of a sudden the whole cyber safety stuff changed from simply being around filters and blocking and technical solutions to, okay, we need to look at education around behaviours and well-being and all sorts of things. And a lot of the responsibility around cyber safety honestly shifted to people who are in charge of well-being. And that's an important absolute need to happen. The challenge there is that to understand the behaviours, you actually have to have some knowledge of the technologies, how they work, and that's where our role as educators is, is so apparent. How do the formulas in Google work? How do you share data? All those sorts of things. And that is, it's not only about um, student well-being and resilience and building that, but it also is this part around we need to have kids understand how they get that fake news that's coming to them. Because if not, we're going to have some pretty gullible kids who follow absolutely anything. Move through to the current day. And what we've got is we've got mobile technologies, anywhere, anytime, cloud technologies. Um, and the biggest challenge at the moment, I would say for anyone, for you guys at the moment, it's about mobile phones, but we'll talk about that in a sec. But the other one is, is around data and privacy and age limits. Um, and I know um, Deb has got some information that she'll be able to add to this, but I'm, I'll plough through and, and see how I go um, with it. But what I really wanted to also do on this page was celebrate the absolutely great stuff that has happened in this um, COVID-19 situation. The celebrations, the people who have gone online for the first time, and this Anzac Day photo is actually my boss at the department. Um, her name's Linda Lazenby. And she worked with not only her own dad, but she worked with a whole bucket loads of dads who were ex-military, 
who were all meeting up on Anzac Day and they all had to meet to have a drink at a particular time. And she worked with all of those guys so that they could all zoom into a meeting and I think that is absolutely amazing because the scenarios for lots of those guys could have been very different on that day and that was their highlight of that day. So, you know, it, the power behind the technology, you know, I'm a fan. A lot of people who are who do cyber safe things are often about locking and blocking. I'm, I'm hoping not to be that at all. Sorry, I'll just get that. Now, not all st things stay the same. And this for me has been a bit of a, um, it broke my heart a little bit looking over the border because there was a lot of work that went into um, keeping mobile phones and making mobile technologies accessible to everyone and any time when it was relevant to teaching and learning. And if you've downloaded this presentation, I have actually put a Fuse link to it, quite an old video of um, Principal Don Collins at Coburg High School. He'll love the fact that I've used this photo because it's the one at the start of his career and he's looking really hopeful. And I'll laugh and I'm sure he won't mind me saying that the ones that I Googled that I found later were obviously when he was, you know, coming closer to the retirement and, you know, probably 15 years of being a principal at a secondary school had, um, had aged us all, I should imagine. But there's Don. Please go and listen to that. And what it is, is it's, when one of his kids made contact with the Today Show when they were demonising mobile technologies and he makes the best arguments about why mobile phones should be part of a classroom and why how we should be teaching kids to use them and, and it's about empowering those kids with using those tools. So not all things stay the same. So I know the mobile phone policy has changed but I also know that it is still got a line in it that says that they can be used for educational purpose and they can build um, purpose and impact, you know, do all sorts of things. And thinking about that day that we unpacked the internet in our schools, I can guarantee there's 20 times more power and capacity in that than was in that school server and that that um, modem that was plugged into the library phone. So, you know, fight, you know, push that one if you can in your schools to try and get that happening. Whilst um, not all things stay the same, not all schools are the same. And this is going to be one of those things that I talked about where we're going to celebrate the successes of schools or it's really going to highlight some great big holes. Um, we have... You know, we have different teachers that we think of in our heads and they are the teachers who are the naysayers. They don't want to use technology. So they have the safest classrooms you've ever seen in your whole life. It's almost like that library without kids in it. Beautiful place, always neat, always quiet. But if you've got schools that have no technology and um, they might have been really comfortable places to operate from and I'm guessing some of you guys that are on this um, session may have teachers in your school that have been pushed beyond their limit. Hopefully they've been pushed to, to try something new. I suspect there would have been a lot of schools that just the people who are on this meeting have probably done most of the work around the stuff that goes online. That could be just a guess of mine, a bit cynical, but um, Please, if you can, you know, give, give them the push and, 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 and help them to do the things that they need to do. Going back to this story, um, uh, Lottie, you talked about um, the kids that you work with. Um, the film here is a 10-year-old film and I've deliberately put it in. I've put some old stuff in and I'll explain why I've put it in. Um, this is a 10-year-old film and it's phenomenal. It, it smells a little bit like an Apple ad, um, but don't let that dissuade you. The learning behind it is phenomenal. I can't watch it without crying, so and that's crying in a beautiful way. Um, but it's looking at um, how for many kids technology can empower them in all sorts of different ways. But on the other side of it, I've got a story, and it's a genuine story from... Um, some of the, uh, well, basically a phone call I got when I was working in the department from a school technician. And the school technician had put together um, 
a, an iPad program for their kids with disabilities. And what you had is the school technician was ringing to get some support to say, look, the teachers at my school really need some help here because they basically want the iPads to be packed away and not used because we are seeing cyberbullying, we're having all sorts of issues that are coming out around it. Now these kids, when I say kids, they were young adults, they were working in a special needs setting and the staff response at this setting was to put the technologies away rather than to look at, well, hold on, if we're looking at cyberbullying, there's a fair chance there may have been bullying going on. Again, taking away the technology, looking at the behaviours. So um, we did work with that school and they maintained their um, iPad program. But the very sad thing was if that technician hadn't made that phone call, those kids would have left school with no one educating them about how to keep themselves safe and responsible and what their expectations were online. Um, because their families were struggling to do it. Um, and so the school was the place where that happened. And that is my plea to your teachers. And I, the fact you're on a Wednesday night on a DLTV session tells me I'm not actually talking to you, but what I'm hoping to do is give you the tools to empower those teachers at your school to come on board with this stuff. Because if we look back at that school that declared what they said they would do for their kids um, about being internationally connected and savvy and all sorts of things, probably your school website says something like that as well. And unless kids know how to work responsibly when no one's working, we're in some strife here. Okay, very quickly. What I did is I just pulled out some stuff around parents and what parents, this is straight off the eSafety Commissioner's website. And when I read it, it just reminded me of the SAMA sort of model. And I'll explain the connection because you're probably going to go, she been drinking or something like that. But no, she hasn't. Well, not yet. Um, what we've got is parents basically talking about what their kids did online. And parents have a really traditional view about the value of the internet and what it does for their kids. And if you look at those statistics about entertainment, it's about finding stuff, it's about doing schoolwork. And by doing schoolwork, I'm going to take a wild guess, a lot of that's written typing work. Um, if you look at doing some problem solving and creativity, it's really low in those numbers. So parents don't see it. And so the challenge is, if you look at the SAMA model and we look at, you know, what's the stuff that parents expect to see? They see a whole lot of substitution stuff, augmentation maybe. When we're looking at the redefining stuff or the redefinition or pushing up to those creative, problem-solving, rich, real activities, parents don't expect to see it. And there's a chance that that's because they haven't seen it. So what my plea is for you guys, who are the guns in your school, um, is to see if you can start to model some of those things that will keep kids engaged, that will um, allow them to be creative. The other thing that I just, this is old statistics and um, that, that were put together by Telstra. They asked parents and teens exactly the same questions. Whilst parents, um, teens, 24% of teens said that their parents were never around when they were online. Only 6% of parents had the same story. Now, I'm not saying who I believe, but I'm just saying, same questions, same families. Kids were saying their parents were never around when they were on the net. Um, parents were saying they're always around on the net. The other one was, and this one I love, because I think anyone who does have your own kids at home will appreciate that 71% of parents believe their children use the internet for research, while only 23% of kids say that they research online. So that's that whole, you know, kids sort of, all right, telling mum and dad, yes, I'm on doing my homework. It's taking five hours, but I have bought a pair of shoes in the meantime. Okay, let's actually look at some of the cyber safety issues that kids defy. Um, kids stated with their priorities, and let's look at how they play out when they're at home or whether they're at school. I, did, I used to do sessions where I would go around to schools right around Victoria, and I would always do a survey with kids telling asking them what were their top issues. And I can almost hand on heart say that when you got down to them, like there might have been different issues online or being promoted or whatever, it came down to these three almost everywhere I went. 
The first one was cyberbullying. The second one was their digital print footprint. And with older kids, it was stuff like sexting and embarrassing and humiliating and things like that. And this one came as a, a constant. And it, it was about anonymity and truth. And it's this belief of who am I really talking to? So who's on the other end of my conversation? And it's not always a predator thing. It it can often be that sort of um, where the two friends are at school and they're having a conversation with the third friend who's online and they're in, well, one of them's hiding and then they're enticing one of them to say nasty comments and all sorts of so inflaming sort of situations. Um, that was, that's one of those. And the other one was that kids' passwords get knocked off all the time. And I'm a little bit cynical of, you know, how many colouring in sheets or posters do we have to do about protect your password? But it is important. But I don't, I'm not sure if, if colouring sheets and, and posters do what we need them to do. The reason that I've got these images up, and I've got them because the parents that you are talking about, I probably wouldn't put the one about you bitch, you know, blah, 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 in, in a parent information night. I'm making the point. I found these images off a very old presentation that I did. And the reason I've put them in is because they are all sites that the parents of kids that we teach now would have used if they used online. So if you've got any Islander, South Australian um, kids, Bebo was huge 10, 15 years ago. Um, you've got uh, MySpace and you'll have the parents laugh and you'll entice them in with conversations. The one that I have here is if anyone's old enough to remember when Steve Brax's son had the car accident and he p had a conversation with all of his friends online about what had happened. Um, of course, the site was open. Everyone could read it and it became the news article in the Herald Sun the next day. Just cruel, just awful and just that awful you know, he didn't know who he was talking to and who was seeing and all sorts of things. The other one is actually from the lovely girls at a lovely school in inner Melbourne. Um, and that's the, that's what they were sending to each other in terms of, and people were shocked when they discovered who the lovely girls were. So the point that I'm making is if you are having conversations with parents is often talk about, you know, what were their experiences with kids uh, as kids and, you know, by using some of these examples, um, probably not that last one, but, you know, I'd take that one out and that's why I've made it that you can do what you like with the presentation. Um, please use it in any way you can. So that's old technologies. But what I'm suggesting now is that whilst the technologies have all changed, the behaviours haven't. Cyberbullying is an absolute Monty for kids being at home and part of that communication that you need to have with your parents is around this whole idea of, um, you know, there are no filters at home. The bullying is not going to happen in school spaces. It's the least likely place that you're ever going to see the bullying occur is in your, you know, Google suite or in your, you know, your Google Classroom or in your any of your teams in, in Microsoft 365, all of that sort of stuff. That's the least likely place you're going to have it. It's most likely going to be happening on the side while you're, you know, delivering lessons or whatever. So it's about making parents aware that that's, that's the likely stuff that's going to happen. I'll talk about reporting it later, but um, basically I'll just cut to the chase. The eSafety Commission has a whole place where you report behaviours. If it's an in-school space, it's probably one that, you, you know, you might want to mull over, get the situation right. Um, and it could be something that comes into school, but a lot of advice is around to parents is there is a place to report a lot of that stuff. Deb, I might get you to jump into that at the end if that's all right. So could you make a note of that just to make sure I'm not telling bad conversations. But what I did want to do is just say, you know, the technology's changed. The bullying just takes different format. This is a TikTok site. Um, it's had 2.6 um, views of, of a nasty couple of nasty pieces of work who have gone through TikToks and cut and pasted them, you know, and they're all the all the, the battling kids. And, you know, these kids don't need this uh, on top of it. But, you know, what's really awful is that one kid created it, but 2.6 million have come in to watch. And sadly, well, I, I would be one of those because I just sort of went, all right, what is current and what's awful? 
Another thing that's going to be happening out in school world when kids are at home is probably the most powerful bit of, of cyberbullying that goes on, which is exclusion. So it's about we're all having a house party, but we're leaving you out. And that's that, you know, exclusion is, is a way to um, articulate bullying. And, and that's a really hard one because it's hard to make kids like other kids. And, you know, and this is not a, this is not an IT thing. This is just an, an every person thing is, you know, how do you try and build inclusion and kids that do include other kids into their um, situations. So Snapchat, um, house party, TikTok, all of those. The next one I'm going to have a look at, and this has actually got a really great resource in the eSafety Commission, and it is around digital footprint. And it's it's presented, I think, in a really smart way with kids designing their own brand. So what is your brand? What do you want your brand to be? And this would be something that I would be doing with older primary kids and secondary kids around building your online presence. The days of don't have social media and don't have a space online and don't you know, don't use those tools. I think that horse was bolted. Um, I did actually take, I had more in here, but the stats were something like, you know, something like 60% of, of kids under 10 had all had their own social media accounts and all sorts of things. So we know kids are using it. What we want them to do is we want them to use it safely, but we want them to present themselves brilliantly. So a great resource from the eSafety Commission around digital footprint about building a brand. And it just goes into some of those ways that, you know, it looks at the brands that they love and um, it talks also about their reputation of their school and how that's built as well. So a really great resource to go and have a look at there. The one around um, who am I really talking to does often, um, yeah, they do, Lottie, they do. There's um, websites for younger kids. Um, one of the things that um, catfish rule, who am I really talking to? This is about someone who's trying to entice someone online to get information. And like I said, it's not always a predator. And one of the things that I've found over the years about talking about this stuff is if you go straight into the predator conversation with parents, it won't shift off anything else. And it's a really tough one. So I try not to bang on about it. And I try to drop it in because it's there. But it is not what kids see as the biggest risk. And it's and it it probably isn't the biggest risk. But of course it is a risk. So you need to be mindful and address it. But what we find is that kids that are vulnerable, vulnerable offline are also vulnerable online. So you would know your kids. You would know your kids who are likely to... Um, be talking to someone whose Skype is down and, you know, who is actually grooming kids. So be aware that it's not always about that, but it can be. Um, and one of the, it sounds ridiculous. It's almost like when someone said, you know, all you got to do around coronavirus was wash your hands. We all sort of went like, what? But, you know, making sure that your kids have good passwords, stop other kids getting their passwords. Um, so, but there are lots of other issues. And again, I'm pointing you to the eSafety Commission because there are bucket loads of issues that the eSafety Commission has dug out. Kids identified three, and I reckon there are pretty darn good three, but there are a bucket load of them here for the eSafety Commission. And it is, that link is where I would push parents. But the other one that I hadn't even thought about was, the, and I had to copy and paste this one for all of our older folk out there, not that I, you know, was plan your digital legacy. I hadn't even thought of it. So if something happens to you, you can plan what happens to all of those tweets that you have created over the years. So there you go. There's a whole lot of, you can donate them all to your loved ones. So good luck with that one. Um, but that is there. All right. So all of those resources. And I am trying to plow through all right i'm going to just do this once digital copyright not my favorite topic in the whole world but i have to address it and i'm addressing it in a different way and i am saying for goodness sake if you can use creative commons please use it if you can use and teach your kids how to do that please do it um, for the high moral reasons of course but there's another reason and i just want to point this out um Schools, teachers, 
university staff and government are the only people in Australia who pay copyright licenses to the copyright agency. And so there is, for one year, $1.23 million, or almost $1.24 million, that is taken from education budgets right around the country and paid in copyright licensing fees. Now, people absolutely are entitled to have that um, compensated. But the bottom line was, when I first joined the department, that bill was $14 million. So because of the internet and because of the use of, of stuff that we go and grab from the internet, it's um, one of those things that um, that bill keeps going up. And the more that we keep using stuff, that bill keeps pushing up. So yes, I'm doing it on behalf of the moral and the right thing to do. And it's a legal thing to do. But I'm also doing it, it's a financial thing because I'd prefer that money to stay and not keep going up in the education budget. I know at the moment um, there's been a, a very quiet settlement deal because New South Wales actually cracked it a bit and sort of said, look, this is a bit insane because we're in fact paying for websites that have got advertising on it. You know, it, it's trashy games, all sorts of stuff. Um, but when we use it, it's like the old photocopier, you pay. So just be mindful of that stuff. Okay. What do you need to have at your school that you need to make parents aware of when they're at home? Whoops, sorry, i just go back here. Um, every student's right to feel safe at school, including the broader learning situations as digital learning environments. So your kids need to be safe when they're working with you in the digital learning environment. And that probably infers that we're talking about online sites, but I think you need to be making sure that your kids are are really comfortable when they're working with you. I'm not going through all of those. The last one that I'm going to go to is explicitly how the behaviours and strategies in place relate to the safe and responsible use of digital technologies. So it's what you need to be able to say, what are you doing in your student engagement policies that is making sure that you are protecting kids when they're working online at home in online spaces that you've created because you are introducing them to stuff and um, we need, you need to just be able to say this is, these are the strategies that I put in place. Um, saying that, what I do want to do is I want to make um, you guys aware is I, I've been around long enough to do two lots of the e-potential, sort of the data behind it around the e-safety stuff. And the first one that we did actually had really... Um, when we talked about, you know, having a safe and responsible use in ICT, the way the question was presented alluded to inside your classroom. So whenever we got the e-potential survey results, the results were, you know, teachers going, yeah, we're battling along with what we're doing. And then you got to the e-safety commission, you know, question and everyone was at the very highest level. Everyone was transformative. And it was because the kid, the question was asking about, are your kids safe at school? Well, they are because it's filtered and, I'm watching them and all sorts of stuff. So it was about classroom practice. But that's not what we educate kids for. We educate kids. We don't teach kids to read simply to read the books in our school library. We teach them to read so that they can go forth and read what choice, have, make decisions about what they read and, and all sorts of things. Um, I would argue that that's the same about using um, digital technologies, about using online spaces. We need to educate them about how they work and how they can work with them. So that's what the second lot of e-potential questions addressed. Um, we were really clear about trying to make that um, clear. Uh, so just, and it is a really hard one, and it's almost the difference between trying to educate kids to be safe responsible, ethical users of digital technologies rather than trying to keep kids safe. And that's a big difference. And if you've got teachers who can't see the difference around that, they'll be the ones who aren't teaching any of this stuff. Um, so it needs to be threaded through. And literacy is the perfect place to do it. You know, literacy hour, two hours, three hours, however many happens at your school, get it in there, I reckon is a really great place to put it. Daryl English, you gave me the big introduction to this one. Anywhere, anytime, me, we, see. All right, what your kids need to be aware of. This is the most, I reckon, fundamental stuff that kids and teachers need to be aware of. 
me we see there are three spaces when you work online and there are pretty much only three and there's interlude between the two a me space is a private space so those of you who have got your cameras off who are you know sitting on your computer cameras off sound off whatever you might be typing you might be buying a pair of shoes i don't know because you are on your me space on your we space a we space is actually what we have created here now the we space is a shared space and none of us could get into here without the link and without being allowed in or being provided a password so a we space is a shared space that only kids can go into. Now your Google site will be that, your other bits and pieces will be that. Anything that your kids come together that you have provided access via a password, etc. That's there. Um, C space is a public space on the internet for everyone. And that's where your kids work has to be schlick, stick and span and spelling corrected and amazing and discussed and um, planned to be put online in a public space so just remembering looking at those the me we see stuff um, just making sure that your kids understand those three different spaces and can I suggest is there's always trouble the only trouble you get into those is if you don't know who you're talking to and that's the audience and that's what some of these kids will do and if any of you guys have ever sent an email to the wrong person and included everyone else um, that's one of those moments where you go oops that was not what I meant to do. I've chosen the wrong audience. I've sent it where I did not intend and often can be embarrassing. The other thing you might have to think about, and this will not necessarily be your younger teachers, this will be your anybody teachers who are just coming to social media at the first time, is knowing what to say online. This is the pin-up girl for stupid from her classroom. She's tweeting about how revolting her kids were, how stupid the parents were, blah, blah, blah. During school time, you may say, oh, that would never happen here. I can guarantee it happens here. Like, it does. It, it is something that is dealt with by principals often, sometimes in closed we groups that, um, that all of a sudden the conversation comes out um, and that people can see. Uh, hot topic. The hot topic at the moment, data and privacy. And this is the one that will hit all the social media stuff that you guys want to use. Those of you who did get a chance to do the Flipgrid, we're going to have a look at that in a sec. Um, but things like Flipgrid are all generally um, have age limits around them. Now, the 13-year requirement is not necessarily because the site is unsafe. So age group things are not necessarily about saying this is dangerous for your kids but it's to comply with a US law that ensures that the data of anyone who declares themselves as under 13 has to be cared for and used in special ways. All right, it has to be stored in a special way, it has to be preserved and it has to be protected. And for lots of social media sites, that's just too hard work. It's easier not to have that. So it is around looking at those sorts of things and um, having a look at the different age groups over on the other side is just a screen dump of Europe is actually going harder and um, they are basically looking at um, age groups of up to 16 in Luxembourg at 16, Romania is 16. So they are, what you're starting to see is if there are any sites that are coming out of Europe, that 13 plus stuff is going to bulk up to 16 plus. So what you're going to find is there are going to be lots of tools that if you're just going on the numbers that you are not going to be able to use not only with primary kids but soon not even secondary kids. So the question comes with how do you use some of these fabulous tools? Can you? Can't you? Um, the first piece of advice is talk to your school, talk to your principal around what it is. ABC iView used to have a 13 plus rating and I think it still does have a 12 or whatever and for a long time there was no me, the ABC me, so there was no space for middle kids at all. So we developed at, at the department um, a document that you could ask parents, were you willing to allow your kids to watch iView and watch things like behind the news and all sorts of stuff. I'm going to give, Rosalind, do you want to, I'm going to give you a call out. <laughs> we can see you. <laughs> it's all right. No worries. 
<laughs> I'm just laughing. I just figured someone would want to know. Um, it, so you might want to just wiggle your mouse to turn, turn the camera off. Um, that would be great. Um, yeah, so how do you get kids on to some of the sites? Sometimes it's possible to ask parents, and that's where I'm going to with all of this stuff. Right, Flipgrid. For those of you who were on early, I did ask if anyone could please um, have a go at Flipgrid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if anybody did manage to do it. So I'm going to go to my, I'm going to stop presenting and you'll probably see the horror that is. I'm just going to go to my internet and present another screen. So just bear with me one sec. I'm going to go to the Flipgrid and have a look if people actually did manage to do that. Two responses. Okay, we got the guys up there, but it's worth having a look. Um, if you guys all go to that link that is on the Flipgrid, I am going to go back to our session. And for those of you who can't see that, present now. I'm going to have a look at a Chrome tab. So let's go and have a look at the Flipgrid. It's going to very quickly share it. What basically happened, the guys um, very quickly um, followed a link I gave them. They downloaded, they created this Flipgrid, and they've all sent me videos that will live online forever and ever and ever. Now, I won't play them. I'll let you go and do that in your own time because we're a bit short on, on whatever, but I am certainly going to have a look at them and see what those guys paste, posted. Um, but what I am going to do now is um, just get you guys to do one other thing is I'm going to ask you to go and have a look at just the terms and conditions of Flipgrid. And if anyone can, whilst you're listening to me, have a look at the Flipgrid site and see if you can go to the terms, conditions, privacy, and just copy and paste into the chat anything that you think a teacher should think about or no before you ever got your kids using something like Flipgrid. All right, so just making sure that people are, um, just go and have a look at the Flipgrid site um, and post that up in the chat if you could find any bits and pieces that you think are relevant for teachers before you would ever go and have a look at Flipgrid. So how do you evaluate a website? I'm gonna give you some heads up there's probably some really good reasons that you wouldn't just throw your kids into a flip grid. And I did this activity with my uni students at UNSW and they were all very young and all very keen and all very excited. And they did it very quickly and all put it through and we're all going, oh yes, we'll use this with our kids when we go and teach. And then what I did is I actually asked them to go and have a look at their technology, go and have a look at the, the conditions and they will find the sorts of things that you'll find, which is things around um, who owns the data, who's allowed into the site. So it was one of those where the uni students all had the excitement of this great new tool. And then what I asked them to do was go and have a look at, well, hold on, yes, it's great and it's exciting, but there's this other side to it. And that's the part about um, data assessment. Deb, I went and found this, the privacy matrix that lives on the department website. And I thought it was a really great way. And I might get you to talk through that at the end, if you're okay, um, around that. Um, for anyone who's from an independent school, there's in fact a, um, a new technologies risk assessment tool on the eSafety Commission site, and that allows you to go and have a look through any potential sites that you might want to use with your kids and go, okay, what do I have to do to make sure I can do this? And a lot of it is around communicating with parents. Privacy, this is my favourite slide ever because this was where legal in the department actually came out with some common sense words um, that I find, and I use it all the time, to get, you must get consent from parents. It's just so much, like there's so many things that you just do. Um, posting and sharing information online or any other way requires consent. Consent must be fully informed. That means parents must know where the stuff is, what you're using, blah, blah, blah. Hence, the um, privacy matrix on the previous page, listing all the sites that you're going to use, that they give their consent freely 
So it's not, oh, you know, you pressured them into it. It's current. So it can't be the kids rock on up in prep and by year eight, you're still using the same. But you signed your kids up to do stuff um, and specific in how the information will be presented and to whom it will be presented. Schools will require signed authority for any work images or information posted online simply because kids own their own content. And that's one of the things around Flipgrid is it says we own everything that you create. Now, I suspect Flipgrid, what they're trying to do is trying to say, well, if we own the content, then we don't have your data. And if you're just using a code, we don't have your data. But I'm not sure. So uh, you would need a, a greater legal mind than mine to, de to work through that one. So I would certainly be talking to parents about that. This is a web, a YouTube video I'm not going to show. It's a brilliant YouTube video for privacy, particularly for secondary kids or for teachers. Go and have a look at it. It's, um, it's European, so it's very exotic, um, but it is um, a, a really good example. But again, always check something before you don't take this into your year nine class until you have a look at it because you know your kids better than I do. Um, I think it's a great resource and I think it's important that we share that with kids. Okay, very, very quickly. This is a really bad site that I ended up getting, um, ended up inside of. It's um, because a relative of mine had actually signed up to this particular dating site with a, um, probably with a Facebook account. Actually, it might have even been with an, it might have even been with an email. And what it does is it pulls in all the data that's not only in your Google or your Facebook, but even if it was in your email, it goes through your address book and pulls all your data out. So it's not just your data it's taking, it's taking everyone in your address book. And so I ended up getting dragged into this dating site with a relative, you know, which was around, you know, hey, George is in your local area. He wants to date you. Do you want to meet for coffee? It was the creepiest site ever. So please... You know, just be aware, try and teach your kids not to sign in with Facebook and not to sign in uh, and never to respond to, do you want to connect with friends? Because that's what Facebook does and that's, you know, when you first join Facebook, you'll have forgotten this, it will have said, do you want to connect with friends? Sounds harmless, of course I do. How does it know who your friends are? The only way it does is it goes through all of your address book and pulls out all that data. Now what happens is, Sign in with Facebook, it goes, okay, here are all your Facebook connections. Some of them will pull out all that information and then be gathering further and further information. Okay, here are the activities that I think would work really well for you to do with your kids around this subject area online while they're at home. The first one I've done face-to-face -face with kids from pretty much grade five up to probably year nine. And it's the whole thing behind it is that we want kids to present a parent information night. I used to get phone calls from the department going, can you come out and do this? We need someone from the department to come and do a safer internet night. And it's like, um, and in the end, it was like I was saying, actually, I'll come out and work with your kids to do their own parent information night. And this was the formula that we followed. And the way that the day goes ahead is it follows these five questions and the kids cook stuff up from those five questions. What are the technologies? What, how does it work? What do you enjoy about it? Again, pa painting a very positive outlook. What are the risks or challenges? And what advice would you give to a parent or someone who was going to use that technology? All of this information was worked through with kids to create three or four slides that they would put together um, to present to parents but it underpinned it was a survey that was done. And the survey was all kids would ask, what were the technologies and the different um, social media and all of the sites that you use? Now, it could be in a family. So it's looking at, okay, so you could actually do a survey with all of your kids doing their family. And of course, their family are going to self-moderate. They're not going to say, you know, I was on Playboy for chat for 12 hours you're probably not going to get that one but you know hopefully not anyway um, so it's about pulling together a survey about the things that students and well in this case families already use but in a classroom face to face it will be that students use and then what you do is you look at the features of those different sites 
let's group them together. What has a chat? What has a, what is a game? Where's the gaming? Where's the collaboration in the game? How does the collaboration occur? So you group those resources according to types and what are their features that are in common? So you classify them. And often the classification becomes a me, do they offer a me, we see option? Can you have a private space? Can you play it privately? Can you do it in a closed group? A la Minecraft for education. Um, or is it a C that it's out there um, being used by absolutely everybody? Um, and how does that collaboration happen? So what you do is you gather that and then you, that's the question around what are technologies do you use? And then it's the exploring about what does it do and how does it work? And that's when you get your kids to go in and have a look at the terms of conditions. I need you to be the expert around this particular piece of technology. So kids will be working on different technologies. They become the, you know, the, the absolute person that knows everything about it. How does it work? What do you enjoy about it? So talking about the positives and then talking about what are the risks or challenges that are, that are within the technology. So what are the alarm bells that you need to be letting parents? And I always put this bit about of younger kids. Um, what do you let them need to let them know? And often if you've got teens, you've got year nines, you've got year eights, they're quite resilient. They go, oh, it doesn't bother me. I can, I can deal with it. But once you say, look, this is for younger kids and you're helping out, you'll get genuine. Well, these, and you'll start to hear probably some of the stories you'll need to shut down a bit, but you will start to hear some of the things that go on with some of the sites. So the idea behind this is that kids actually lead that information night and they all present it, whether or not it's in the school hall or whether or not it, it is in different ways. Um, and it could be that you present it with kids' voices behind it um, and so that we're not looking at kids on video and stuff like that. So that, for my mind, is like it's almost a whole terms topic. I've done it in a day with kids, um, but it is a full-on day. And the beauty of now is that there is unfiltered internet at home but you need to talk through with parents what the project is so that's one of those projects i have my very 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 favorite ever um, and it is old and i do not apologize one little bit for sharing uh, i need to get the hyperlink out of that hold on let me just grab the hyperlink out of that where am i hyperlink no, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to edit hyperlink. Anyway, if you go into that, if you just Google talent shows cyber safety, it is the best video. And it follows the principles of a bloke. It's not made by this guy. Marco Torres used to do the rounds of Australia doing all um, presentations and things. And the key thing that I learned from him is if you want kids to make videos, the best thing you can do is do a brainstorm about what are all the things that you would expect to see in a video about cyberbullying and the kids go, oh, I'd expect to see a computer, I'd expect to see a kid crying, I'd expect... So you put up all the list of all the obvious things and then you go through the list and you remove some of them and say, so I don't want to see a computer in this, I don't want to see a kid crying. And so it make kid, makes kids think about how they create their message. The reason that Talent Show is such a classic example, it was in fact made by Saatchi and Saatchi as a community and they are the world's leading advertising agency. So it's, it's done very well, but it's done so very quickly. And it has a really great line in it that is my favourite, which is don't cyberbull delete cyberbullying, don't write it. But my most important one is don't forward it. For, for many kids, they assume that I'm not doing any bullying if I'm participating or I'm forwarding that message on. So those 2.6 kids, 2.6 million kids watching the TikTok kids being humiliated, would not see themselves as cyberbullying at all. So it's making that apparent. Those resources are all there for you to use. Um, that's my timer, so I'm just going to, and I'm whipping through this. There's another um, resource there called Let's Fight It Together. Australia actually paid, it's a British resource that Australia paid for to be able to use, so it's copyright free for us to use. It's a beautiful film, and it probably goes for about 20 minutes. But the power in this is that you get your kids to, in fact, make um, interviews with the characters. So what would be the questions that you would ask Kim, who is the bully? What would you ask Joe, who is the, um, the victim? And what is Rob, who is the bystander? And if you get kids to articulate what they would say, Kim the bravado bully, she'll be saying things that are obvious, like, well, I was only joking and he can't take a joke and all of these sorts of things. 
and the power in that is that kids actually then when they hear other kids say it recognize it so it's really a powerful way for them to um without naming the kids in their room who do it it, it outs the behaviors okay few bits and pieces here what we've got is um getting kids to make using that mobile phone to make short videos teach them the skills around editing on their phones all of those things um in that they could make a short ad that would go to their parent information night um there's a whole lot of great resources in acme around building um you know, building storyboards and all sorts of things. Also camera actions and things like that. They can also create a storyboard in, in um, sites like Canva. Um, some really lovely templates in there for people. Or if you want to do that online, offline stuff, kids can draw it with a pencil and a piece of paper. So planning that stuff out. Some other activities. And I'm going to, I'm doing a big that for now. And I'll tell you why, because I just got charged about $95 for I signed up to use it and it automatically and I forgot $95 for a year's use so did two of my students at uni who cannot afford it so um, if you do use Prezi just make sure that you keep your eye on your account because that was this week and I wasn't too happy with them so that's my private little delete but response create a presentation and there are lots of ways that you can do that and that is for your parent information night um, one of the things that if you are using any of these tools that have the right age groups and things, log in with, um, students can log in with their Google accounts, which is their school email accounts. Um, they could respond by creating an infographic. And I look like I'm doing a bit of a plug for Canva at the moment, but there is a fantastic project on at the moment whereby they each day they're releasing a Canva project that's free for kids to do. If, particularly if you've got upper, sec upper primary, secondary kids, that kids can do an investigation around the UN glo Global Goals for Sustainability. So they do it, Canva have pre-prepared with some information and then your kids go in and they modify that information and they can share it with their parents' permission or whatever. So it's about um, Canva have provided that. Um, one thing I was asked to do, the U, um, the U, uh, New South Wales um, curriculum outcomes, I actually did the Victorian ones as well. So they're in there as well because I knew those. Um, this is one of those things that reporting is really important while your kids are at home. Um, and this is a quote I use. It's not in great English, but it was genuinely from a kid in rural New South Wales, uh, sorry, New, rural Victoria. And I asked the question, what would have to happen for you to go to ask an adult for help? And he said, but I think most kids just let it go because they're scared if they tell their parents, we'll take their computers away from them and then they'll have nothing. And so it is that, um, you know, it, it's that take some care with parents because a lot of their responses will be simply, it's easier to take the technology out. Um, Again, reminding you that there is a reporting place for the eSafety Commissioner um, and that is there for you to have a look at. And this is just one slide and I got my uni students to do this um, and I think it would also be a really good activity for families to do at home. And it's, it's uh, what year was it? I can't remember, but it, it would be over 10 years ago. And it's Robin Triver, who is an excellent, um, presenter around this space, really excellent presenter. She presented many, many years ago about this, this world called um, Siberia. And what she talks about is she talks about um, a mo digital moral compass and she talks about the technologies and the way that kids um, need to behave. So it is around that development of those great kids who don't want to do the horrible stuff to other kids and things like that. It's a fantastic TED Talk, even though it's old. And the reason that I present it is it talks about the MySpaces and it talks about the MSN Messenger. But that's the technologies that the parents of our kids were using. So the conversation that could be the starter is at home is let's have a look at this. And OK, oh, haha, I remember MSN and I remember MySpace and I remember whatever. But what are the technologies that do that now? And I think that's a really great conversation starter for families at home. Um, I'm going to end there. 
and I am going to uh, hand over Deb. Is there anything that you want to add? I think I've gone, I've gone a couple of minutes over and I do apologise, but we did start a little late. So I'm going to stop presenting. Hi, Sandy. Um, can everybody hear me? Yep. Great. Um, look, I won't, I won't talk a lot because we have gone over time and it's reaching the bewitching hour when people are thinking about their stomachs Thanks. want to eat. But you did reference a couple of things, which was the, the privacy matrix. And I'm just going to um, put a link in the chat line that takes people directly to the privacy page on uh, our department website, which has been updated in the last... Uh, six months or so, it is much easier to read. I know reading uh, department policies is um, sometimes a challenge, but it, it it's really easy to read and it in particular gives you some clear advice around what you need to do in terms of providing your parent community with information about what online services you're using. Um, and that's called an online services notification. And what I'm going to do is put another link in here as well, which is to a school that has followed this advice and they've put the online services notification on their website. So if you're looking to do something similar, um, that's a school that's done it already. The other thing that the department's uh, privacy page does is clearly, uh, more clearly articulate when you need which kind of consent. So when is it okay to use opt-out um, consent? When is it okay to use opt-in consent? And under which circumstances do you not need consent at all, which there are some. So I won't go on about it, but the, that page is, is well worth looking at and it is an easier read um, than it used to be. So um, I might leave it at that unless there's any questions that somebody uh, would like me to answer. No, I think you've um, covered that extremely well. Thanks, Deb. And um, coming from school, it's still struggling with a privacy impact assessment for some of this uh, online learning. Um, I can't I can't stress enough how important it is to go to that page that um, Deb has mentioned. Very, very important. But it looks as though I think we've covered off on all of the questions that arose during the chat. I'd just like to take this opportunity to say, Thank you very much to Sandy. Thank you so much for coming on all the way from New South Wales to talk to us. Um, and uh, wish you all the best for the next few weeks or hopefully, um, gosh, who knows how long it's going to be these days. But anyway, all the best for your own online learning, all the best for your children and their students and what they're learning and how they're being safe online. Um, but thank you so much.